Uh, so it's, uh, it's an enormous uh, pleasure and honor to be here with, uh, with Lars and also Angela and also to be here among you. Um, I do feel like I'm uh, speaking uh, somewhat to the converted or to the choir, but, um, but I don't think we should be complacent about our beliefs or our approaches. So in the spirit of uh, Robert Kuttner, I'm going to be, I'm going to issue some trigger warnings that I'm going to be deliberately provocative about about some things a little bit further down uh, uh, in my uh, presentation. Now, I was thinking of a title. Uh, I thought, Taxation, Equality, and Democracy. It's not a TED Talk. Don't get any expectations up about that at all. Uh, so um, 230 years ago, during the year of the French Revolution, Benjamin Franklin said, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except for death and taxes. But now that we're confronting the death of the planet, some are questioning whether we need taxes to pay to save it. Uh, as we heard yesterday, some argue that governments should finance a Green New Deal by creating, printing money, or borrowing it. Um, so I think it's useful to ask and hopefully answer the question of why we have taxes. Now this doesn't, um, sorry, this isn't completely in order because I, uh, um, but uh, at a very basic level, we have taxes to establish a national currency. Government imposition of taxes and acceptance of them in their national currency only gives it, only give it, gives it a legitimacy that it doesn't accord to other uh, uh, forms of currency. We also have taxes to create market incentives and disincentives for different activities, like tobacco taxes and carbon taxes, though these only work as well as, you, as the market system works. Given the hostility of many conservative politicians towards carbon taxes and in establishing a petrostate, uh, apparently they don't think the market mechanism works very well with fossil fuels, but against all evidence, they think that tax credits will increase the use of public transit and any other <laughs> family activity. So uh, taxes also help to stabilize the economy through macroeconomic business cycles. As the economy slows, taxes decline, and welfare and unemployment compensation payments increase, which helps to stimulate the economy with deficits. And when there are booms, they should do the opposite by generating surpluses and slowing down the economy. Uh, taxes, all, of course, uh, perhaps most importantly, raise revenue to pay for, for public services and for public investments. Some would say that we don't need to increase taxes to pay for public services or public investments in a Green New Deal and that we can finance it by creating or borrowing money, but I disagree for a number of reasons. While I, while I agree that deficits are not necessarily an economic threat, they can be more of a political threat. Whether it's rational or not, the public gets concerned about deficits and deficits are used by the right to attack governments or call, and call for cuts in public spending. Being in debt to large pools of capital, especially if they're foreign lenders, can make a country extremely vulnerable, as so many countries have found, particularly Latin American countries in the 1980s and Greece and Argentina recently. As James Carville, who helped uh, Bill Clinton get elected, said, I used to think that if, I, if there was reincarnation, I wanted to come back as the president or the pope, but now I would like to come back as the bond market, because you can intimidate everybody. And uh, Tommy Douglas understood that quite well, uh, 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 as well. Um, so by raising revenue to pay for public services, taxes also divert money from the private economy and put it mostly into public services, decommodifying those parts of the economy. So paradoxically, this diversion of money from the private economy to the public economy increases economic growth because spending on public services stimulates the economy more than tax cuts do and what's called the balanced budget multiplier. Now, while I'm certainly guilty of it too, 12 years ago I wrote an article calling for an environmental new deal, there can be an inherent contradiction, at least in the short term, in calling out for major economic stimulation through a Green New Deal. Only one quarter of our GHG emissions come from direct fuel consumption by households, with three quarters from industry uh, and business consumption in the production of goods and services, uh, including in the production of electric vehicles and a, and a whole lot of environmental goods and services. So it doesn't really make sense to run an economy gangbusters to save the planet because instead we'll be making the planet burn faster. Instead, we need to use taxes to help slow down economic production in certain areas. 
uh, uh, and to finance the transition to a low carbon, lower consumption and more egalitarian economy. I'm not opposed to full employment, but let's ensure that it comes with fewer working hours and more time for leisure, for recreation, political and community engagement, just as Marx and Keynes envisaged centuries ago. We have a lot of wealth in our society, but it's very unevenly distributed. I think our problem is more one of redistribution than one of creating more economic growth and consuming more of the Earth's resources. I don't think we should leave future generations with greater financial and social debts on top of the environmental debts that we're leaving them. So finally, but also most importantly, taxation is important for income redistribution and increasing equality, although they haven't necessarily done a good job of that recently. Many people make the connection at an abstract level between the taxes that they pay and the public services that they receive. But what gets people really fired up, I've, in my history working as an economist, uh, what people get, gets people really fired up about taxes is whether they're fair or not. Uh, despite what Margaret Thatcher claimed, I think most people feel like they're part of a collective society, except that we all have to contribute to collective goods, just as everybody's expected to do the dishes, the cooking, and housework in a family. We're also born with a strong sense of fairness and equality, with most accepting that random fortune and circumstance mean that some are more privileged and should contribute more than those less lucky and, and less privileged although some don't have the humi humility to realize that they're born on third base. So in, um, uh, this is a, just a chart that shows the multiplier effect of, uh, of, uh, of uh, public spending. It, it, it creates many more jobs and uh, more economic growth than uh, tax cuts do. Um, uh, and this is a chart that shows the, uh, uh, the decline in, 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 uh, in, government, uh, in government spending, which I'm going to get to uh, uh, soon. In previous decades, we had, uh, I think there was a question uh, yesterday. Uh, in previous decades, we had top marginal personal income tax rates of over 70%, close to 90%, or we told that it was over 100%. Uh, because it was accepted that taxes should strongly redistribute top incomes. That would have been seen as absolutely insane until recently. A few years ago, um, Tom Mulcair said he didn't think top tax rates should go above uh, 50%. But recently, we've seen politicians like uh, Alexandria Octavia Cortez calling for top marginal rates to rise up to 70%. Bernie Sanders has a wealth tax proposal that would aggressively redistribute wealth and said he didn't think that billionaires should exist. And in his new book, uh, Capital and Ideology, Thomas Piketty calls for top rates of tax of 90% on annual wealth taxes, inheritance taxes, and on income taxes. So things have changed. Popular support for a wealth tax in Canada is approximately 70%, with quite a few billionaires in the US supporting wealth and inheritance taxes. There are established, this is new to me, there are established organizations in the States and also in Canada uh, of wealthy people, particularly young people born to wealthy families who advocate for strong wealth and inheritance taxes. So we've lived through at least three decades from the 70s and the 80s during which tax was a, was a dirty word. 1978 saw the uh, passage of Proposition 13 in California, which Robert Kuttner wrote about in detail. The National Taxpayers Union was founded in 1977 with Grover Norquist's um, Americans for Tax Reform founded in 1985. So um, the Americans for Tax Reform, are, uh, like the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, are conservative organizations more focused on shrinking the size of government than on reducing taxes. Reducing taxes are seen as a vehicle to shrink government, or as Grover Norquist said, I don't want to abolish government, I simply want to reduce it to the size where I can drag it into the bathroom and drown it in a bathtub. <laughs> So his tool for doing that was the Taxpayer Protection Pledge that 95% of Republican lawmakers signed to oppose all increases to corporate in and income taxes, the most progressive taxes of all. In Canada, we've also had a long-term decline in overall tax revenues, with the federal government revenues as a share of the economy being squeezed to their lowest in 70 years. Not quite small enough to fit in a bathtub, but getting there. Now, if the federal government revenues were at their 50 year long-term average as a share of the economy, they'd be uh, uh, $50 billion higher annually. 
uh, very significant amount. That's a, approximately a, 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 a bit over 2% of GDP. The tax cuts that were made by liberal and conservative governments in Canada have largely benefited top incomes and corporations. There's been an extraordinary decline in the total taxes paid by business with not just cuts in the corporate tax rate, uh, but also the virtual elimination of capital taxes, the shift from sales taxes to value added taxes, and significant cuts to property taxes for business. While we've had cuts to top tax rates, uh, uh, and this chart shows, I mean, what's really remarkable, so the, um, the dark blue line is a marginal effective tax rate, which doesn't just include the uh, corporate income tax rate, uh, but it was cut from f about 42% down to about 13 or 14%. So that was cut by two thirds. And that incorporates other things like value added taxes on business. And that was supposed to push up business investment. It's gone in exactly the opposite direction. So it's been a massive failure in that way. Um, we've had cuts to uh, 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 top tax rate. So it, it, this is a chart from the IMF basically saying that there's a race to the bottom in terms of uh, corporate income tax rates. It's not just in Canada, but around the world. So we've had cu cuts to top tax rates, especially more recently at the provincial level. But what's really reduced the top tax rate for top incomes are expansion of tax loopholes, which allow the wealthy to avoid the statutory tax rate in many ways, uh, through stock options, capital gains, private corporations. As Warren Buffett has said, because of these loopholes, he pays a lower rate of tax than the person who cleans his office says. So um, uh, uh, we've had eroding tax fairness in Canada for a number of decades, which means that the top incomes, so this is a chart of, uh, of the income group, and this was done by uh, Mark Lee at the CCPA a number of years ago, and that's the overall tax rate if you account for all the different taxes and their incidence. So the top 1% plays an overall lower rate of tax on their income than all other uh, groups. I recently saw a similar uh, a chart for that um, in the United States, and it's, uh, it's a similar thing as well. So uh, our tax system, uh, John had, uh, had, had a slide up there about progressivity. If you include all the taxes, it's not particularly progressive if you account for all of those things. Um, and these figures don't even account for the hundreds of billions that Canada's wealthy and corporations uh, stash offshore. Accounting for these would increase, significantly increase calculations of inequality and also the effective tax rates for both the wealthy and the large corporations would be much lower. Uh, there's been an enormous, um, this is a chart of inequality. I mean, it's, it's sort of interesting to see when inequality, uh, you saw some charts previously about, about wage stagnation starting in the 1980s. Uh, well, uh, that's when the top 1% uh, income group really increased their share of national income. So it's very clear where that, want, where that went. Um, uh, so until recently, it, 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 it was, uh, um, uh, sorry, this chart shows also the, the, the increase in corporate funds in the top 12 tax havens. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's escalated uh, massively. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, over a quarter of the foreign direct investment around the world is actually in shell corporations. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's in tax havens. Uh, and that's similar for Canada as well. So um, a lot of the figures that we've got at, at national level don't account for this. So that inequality is even, is even greater. Um, until recently, it was generally accepted that there wasn't all that much money at the top. We talk about taxing the rich and corporations, but behind doors, some, some of us said that to pay for public services, we'd really have to have an adult conversation about taxes and have to increase consumption taxes, payroll taxes, and income taxes on middle incomes, just like they do in Scandinavia. Uh, I always took a more left populist position just by inclination, but not, not because I knew anything more. But uh, what I think most of us didn't realize is just how fat the tails are, how, how much income and wealth has become concentrated at the top, or uh, for economists speak, how fat the tails are in terms of the uh, distribution, the normal distribution. They're far from normal. There is actually a lot of money up there at the top. 
uh, for the top 1% of the largest corporations, we need, to, we need to tax and target them even more, as Julie also talked about. So um, uh, these are some charts that show the, 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 the Canadian uh, uh, estimates of the offshore wealth uh, 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 abroad. There's approximately um, uh, um, uh, six, six billion U.S. according to, so about eight billion in Canada. These are some low estimates from Zuckman. Uh, um, this is a chart, this is a very interesting thing that came from the IMF recently. It's their estimated revenue lift losses from profit shifting in 2013, so six years ago. It uh, just came out recently from the IMF. For the OECD countries, it's uh, 400 billion. For, uh, or, 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 or for, and for non-OECD, or 400, uh, over that, for non-OECD countries, about 200 billion. So over $600 billion revenue losses each year. In Canadian dollar terms, that's 800 billion. It's probably close to a trillion. So a trillion dollars is being lost. Uh, or close to a trillion from profit shifting by corporations because of uh, because of uh, 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 because of weak co international corporate tax rules, um, uh, and and it's even more of an issue for 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 uh, for low income uh, OECD countries, African countries. It's a higher share of their GDP, and those countries depend much more on corporate taxes for their revenues, and they have very pressing. Uh, uh, pressing needs for, uh, uh, for public spending, as Julie uh, uh, very el eloquently talked about, and it's a matter of, ma of life and death uh, in those countries. And so that's why uh, organizations like Oxfam and other development organizations have been at the forefront of some tax justice uh, movements internationally. So um, uh, uh, our organization came up with a platform for tax fairness uh, uh, with not especially radical proposals and cautious estimates of the revenues. So, uh, uh, these are some of the estimates of the revenues from the main positions there. Closing tax loopholes, 16 billion. Making our tax system more progressive, 16 billion. Tackling tax havens and uh, tax dodging, 6 billion. Addressing climate change, 5 billion. It all adds up to over 40 billion. So we can get those revenues. Now it turned out, so the, the, the Parliamentary Budget Office has been costing the proposals of different parties, which has been fascinating, because they've got a lot more information than, than is available to us. Uh, and, and invariably, their estimates have been higher than some of the estimates that we've come out with. Um, the next chart is some of the progressive tax measures that have been uh, uh, announced in the election so far. The NDP announced a 1% tax on wealth over 20, uh, over 20 million. Six billion dollars, they've estimated, and that includes uh, uh, some avoidance as well. So it's been very interesting to see that and, and see the different estimates of that. So um, I've never understood why people on the left have been suspicious or critical of populism. To me, it seemed anti-democratic, and also as if you're seeding popular defeat, not even wanting to engage in class conflict when your troops are getting slaughtered. To quote Warren Buffett, they, uh, again, there's been class warfare going on for the last 20 years, and my class has won. We're the ones who have got our tax rates reduced dramatically. So how do we achieve change? How do we wage war and how do we win? I, fir I firmly believe that uh, social democratic parties were able to achieve progress in the post-war period, partly because lurking behind was the threat of socialism and communism. So um, more radical uh, social and uh, communist movements were in a sense the friends of, uh, of social democratic uh, parties and not their enemies. Uh, the vested interests, as uh, Keynes called them, realized that they had better share the wealth or else they could lose it. Right after the Soviet Union disintegrated in the early 1980s, we experienced a sharp shift to the right in Canada and elsewhere. Privatization, free trade, and, or, or what should be called investor protection agreements, because that's what they are. They're not free trade agreements, they're actually investor protection agreements. Um, many social democratic parties shifted rightward on economic issues, including Obama, embracing market solutions and globalization, things like nudge economics, while leftward on, on social issues. As uh, Thomas Piketty has uh, demonstrated in his new book, they became more parties of the educated elites, um, people like you and me, than the parties of the workers. The working class left in the gutter of economic progress and political life have been easy pickings for right-wing national pop, uh, populists. 
Um, you can see some of the cynicism or why, why people get cynical about some climate change issues. I recently flew across to Paris and, and uh, for some meetings on international corporate tax reform. I calculated the, 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 uh, the, the, greenhouse, emission, uh, the greenhouse emissions involved with that. Uh, and I'll, I'll probably take three flights this year. They amount to about four, four, four tons of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, my having a hybrid car has saved me one ton. So uh, I, I feel like I look, need to look at myself. I mean, I, I, uh, it's hard to be critical of people who, 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 who have got pickup trucks when, when, when they see us and, and, and others like us flying around the world preaching to, uh, about climate tra change, but, uh, but, 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 but still emitting a lot more in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, emissions. So, um, but we've been able to achieve some progress following the financial crisis, but generally only when there's some threat out there. Remarkably, now we have uh, the prospect potential for fairly radical international corporate tax reform, but it's come across from grassroots activism, but also because right-wing governments felt threatened. So there are uh, right now OECD, uh, G20 discussions on fairly radical international tax reform, uh, but it's happened only because there have been conservative governments in the UK, Australia, France, the US and India, that have felt compelled to introduce special taxes on Google and Facebook and others. Um, they felt threatened by the populist rage, and so they've introduced these special taxes. Um, so in but in Canada, liberals have been sitting on their hands saying that they're waiting for an international consensus position. Uh, but we would have never got to where we are internationally if individual countries had not gone ahead and acted on their own. I'm a bit more confident about progress in Canada with a potentially min minority government where the NDP and the Greens forced the Liberals to introduce progressive tax measures rather than continuing to drag us to, to, to the centre right. But we have to have that centre that, 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 that center of uh, the centre pulling to the left rather than pulling more to the centre right, which we've had for, for such a long time. Thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.